Traveling the Vortex. We've joined the Doctor as he travels the Vortex and arrive at episode number 415, where we will not die to elevator music. I'm Keith. I'm Sean. I'm Glenn. How are you guys? Pretty good. I'm excited about this lofty goal. (laughs) (laughs) It's important to set goals. It's kind of always been on my bucket list to not die to elevator music. I've never told it. It's relaxing. If we're putting things on our bucket list of what we're not going to do, mine's extensive. So... (laughs) Die. That's a really big bucket. <laughs> <laughs> that is also on my list. That's the number one die. on the list. Is... <laughs> Do you guys uh, have a good week? Listen to elevator music is a close number two. But... <laughs> Depends on the elevator music. No. Depends on the elevator, I suppose. Some elevators have decent music. No. I don't know what kind of elevators you're riding in. I've been on a rarely, couple. Rarely the ones I normally am on do not have any music I, at I all. I defy so. you to find a good elevator with good music. You know, it's hard to find an elevator with music anymore. Oh, yeah. They just don't do it much anymore. Like you stand in silence. <laughs> While everyone tries to get connection on their Yeah, door. right. <laughs> I'm going to start humming. There you go. <laughs> You'll be the elevator I will be music. the elevator music. That's yeah. a good idea. Because hum, hum it, good stuff. It's not awkward <laughs> enough to stand in an elevator with a bunch of strangers trying to get signal on their phones and have to try and interact with somebody. But if somebody's humming, I think that will take the edge <laughs> off. <laughs> or make them more awkward either way. No. <laughs> Did you guys do anything exciting this week? Besides record another co- uh, episode of uh, TARDIS? Uh, that was exciting. It was exciting. It was yeah, fun. it was. We're having a blast doing it. I'm, I'm glad I was able to join in this time. Yes. Well, you were with us on the Cartmel interview, yes. and then uh, just Sean and I, and then this last, or the one that's getting ready to come out. Uh, well, three of us managed to get there along with uh, Tim. Tim. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll call him Richard this week. Tim. Tim. <clears throat> yeah, if uh, viewers, if you haven't already, go be sure to check out Sci-Fi For Me uh, YouTube channel. They've also got Sci-Fi For Me.com. You can go there and find links to their YouTube channel if that's easier. And uh, if you didn't know, we've already talked about it a little bit, but if you didn't know, we do a... Uh, video podcast basically uh it's a, a doctor who themed the one of their anchors tim harvey joins us uh each week on the podcast when we talk about doctor who so yeah and it's usually about a half hour and it's a lot of fun so are, are they no longer vlogs when they're when they're video well uh, you know i mean Web it's blogs? yeah it's it's t- that kind of technically guy? it's technically a vlog but i mean i think when you are a youtube channel creator you kind of just they're episodes you know i mean they're it's it's YouTube episodes, basically. Gotcha. Be sure to check that out. Yeah, absolutely. We went and saw Aquaman. Thoughts? It was pretty good. It's probably the second best DCEU movie. <laughs> it wasn't nearly as fun as I thought it would be. <laughs> the, the bar was only set high by Wonder Woman. So. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but it still was an hard to achieve second other best. Other lofts, the, you know, two of six is pretty good. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Head and shoulders above the... Yeah. It, it, and it was it was crazy and a, rather enjoyable. I didn't laugh as much as I thought I would. I thought it would be more, more funny. And um, yeah, huh. it just kind of was there for me. I didn't hate it, but I didn't absolutely love it either. It was what I expected. I, I appreciate the fact that they leaned into the, uh, <coughs> the cheesiness of the character. Pretty heavily, uh, and all of the supporting casts really kind of ham it up a little bit, and I appreciated that. We're also halfway through the first season of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I've heard nothing but good things about that. It's really enjoyable. I like it. There's a lot of great humor in it. It's very charming. We did a, uh, a double feature today with our our day off. Ooh. We were quite pleased and surprised to find out that we had Martin Luther King Day off. So I was off, Mel was off from the church. So we went down to Kansas City and saw Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, which is that? really good. It's as good as everybody's making it out to be. It may even be the best Spider-Man movie that's been made so far. Best animated film of the year? Certainly. I mean, yes, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I had to think about what else came out this year, but yeah, I think it's. Uh, I think it is. It's very cool. It's very colorful. It's a lot of fun. And uh, if you know anything about Spider-Man... You will get so much more out of it than I did. Because <laughs> I don't know anything about, you know, other than, hey, that's Spider-Man. Uh, and then we went and saw Glass. Is it as bad as everyone's making it sound? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting ripped apart. It is getting ripped apart. And, and once it's, again... It's going to be hard for him to 
not defend a movie in that trilogy. That trilogy now. So. Well, here's here's the deal. Uh, Once again, it, it it falls kind of into the same trap that the village did. The village is not nearly as bad a movie as everybody made it out to be. Yeah, it was. No, it wasn't. It yeah, was it was. Bad. But it was advertised as a horror film, and everybody went expecting this big, shocking horror film with a great twist at the end. And instead, it was kind of an okay film with a really horrible twist at the end, and everybody <laughs> went berserk. But overall, it's not a bad film. This one, it's a satisfactory... I mean, because you want to see these characters. That's why you go. Is we, we, You know, you want to see Elijah and David and... and uh, whoever we're going to call James McAvoy. <laughs> I'm not even sure. Which, all, all of them. All of them. Um, you, you want to see these characters interact together. The problem is, you remember when we saw Predator 2 and the alien skull was up on the wall and co- fandom collectively lost their minds and went, oh, that's going to be so cool. Did you see what they did? That means this is set in that universe. Like, ah, the potential of that. Okay, well, when Bruce Willis showed up at the end of Split, it was kind of like that moment. The potential is far greater than the actualization of what happens. It's it's good, it's worth seeing, but it's not going to live up to the expectations of anybody who went, oh my God, this is in that same universe. So, what'd you do, Glenn? I didn't do anything. <laughs> At all? At all? I watched the Chiefs get stomped on last night. All right, well, should we move on to news? Let's. First up in news, the Radio Times has an article... Uh, where Chris Chibnall has dropped hints that we can expect uh, some classic monsters returning and a new storyline for Yaz in the next season. What, you mean things that the previous Radio Times article pointed out <laughs> they should do for next season, they're actually going to do next yeah, season? <gasps> Whoa. I'm going to sit over here and hold my peace. Uh, to be fair, <laughs> to be fair, he apparently said this prior to the, that episode or that uh, uh, issue coming out. Or that article coming out because it says he was speaking at a special screening of the New Year's Day special res- resolution. Yeah, uh, I'm assuming must have been earlier this year, and uh, that's when he told uh, young, it was a young audience member that had asked him about uh, the yes. future of Yaz, and and then later he kind of let drop that uh, they might be considering some classic monsters. He might he might uh, lift his edict of no classic monsters returning for next season. So. Hmm. So here are some of the quotes. Uh, Chibnall, in response, said, that's a really good question. I think that some of these questions may be answered in the forthcoming season. (coughs) And that's pretty much all he said. Wait and see. Um, And then Amanda Gill pointed out that she's worried about uh, her getting her police job back because then she might have to leave the TARDIS. And she doesn't want to do that. Yeah. (laughs) And then he also, um, his exact quote on the classic, quote-unquote classic monsters, he said, well, maybe we'll do some classic monsters then. I'll have a think. That doesn't necessarily mean he is going to. I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Uh, that very much well, sounds like he he's... isn't. <laughs> sounds like he's placating a fan at a at an event going, I'll think about it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I it think depends on how much of the next season's already written. The, the, the ratings were down for resolution, but there was a, a, a upswelling of reaction for bringing a Daleks back for resolution. So maybe they're taking their cues from that too. So. And the exact uh, question references Cybermen, Sweeping Angels, and Daleks. Yeah. Specifically. Well, I can't be excited now. So not truly classic either. So, yeah. I'd like to see the Weeping Angels back. Quit dogging on the Weeping Angels. They need another good story. They had two clunkers there for a while. So, Bring back the... Uh, if it's a good story. I just don't want another blink. Statue of Liberty. Bring back... That's right. That's why it's bring back, back the blink ones. Don't 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 go to this <laughs> giant Statue of Liberty. Hey. Statue of Liberty was cool. Leave it to Big Finish. They're doing work. Weeping Angels good. Huh? Leave it to Big Finish. They're doing Weeping Angels Are way they? better. Oh, good. Like the classic series... Classic Doctor's New Monsters, the fifth Doctor Weeping Angel story was really good. So, oh, good. Hmm. What's up next? Well, the final two classic era no- uh, stories are getting novelized. Wait, I didn't say that right. So, there are two target, there are two stories that have no. never been novelized. There you go. There are two classic stories that have never been novelized. There's only two left. Everything, only else, two. everything else has been novelized now. Resurrection of the Daleks. And Revelation of the Daleks. 
both coming thanks to Eric Sayward. Yeah, and it sounds like this is uh, thanks to the success of the little target runs that they did last year with Day of the Doctor. Oh, okay. Um, uh, the Christmas one. Um, once upon a, twice upon a time. Twice upon a time. And uh, Rose, I think, was one of them. And, well, I guess Christmas four, Invasion. Because Christmas Invasion was one. Yeah. Um, and since they, they had some success on that, BBC Books has decided to uh, release them. But it sounds like next year they'll come out as hardback editions. And then in 2020, they'll get the the Target novelization look of the uh, paperback. So, so it's getting like the shot of uh, work. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Right. And I think City of, did City they do of Death. They didn't do ba- Shada yet. But, well, they did a paperback of Shada, but they didn't. But it wasn't didn't, Target. Yeah, do the okay. Target. Target look. <laughs> right, the Target look. Target style. Target style. So that's exciting. Sean especially was trying for, to think of which ones these were. Yeah, these are the first two of the fifth and sixth hours. And our last bit of other bit of Dalek news is the Daleks Master Plan is coming out on vinyl. I think I was the only one excited about that. (laughs) (laughs) What what color is the disc? Oh, the discs are gorgeous. They're blue. Are they? Blue vinyl. Are they? Sure. (laughs) <laughs> I, I keep looking at them, and I think maybe it's this picture. They're but blue. Are they? They're blue. Are they? Yes, they're blue. Okay. <laughs> Must be my computer monitor, because they look gray. They're bluish gray. That's blue. I think it's gray. It's not TARDIS blue, but it's no, gray. No, they're no. They're heavyweight no. translucent blue. Oh, trans- that's why they look like that. They're translucent. Okay, so if you look at the one on the far edge, you can tell yeah. the, that it's blue or in a translucent. Okay. That's why, because they're, they're They're laying on yeah. top of each other. Yep. I think the artwork looks gorgeous on the covers. So. Oh, yeah. Seven discs. Yeah, Sean, if you uh, want to get this for me for next Christmas, because one Christmas you got me Genesis the Daleks on vinyl, if you want to get this for me, I would love it. It'd be great. It's a great idea. Put it. Put In fact, write it down now. Here's my idea. That's what you're going to get me for Christmas next year. Got it. Comes out February 15th. Okay. So you better get on it now. Keith, you going to buy him the record player? Why not? I have a record player. You want to really? watch it? Yeah, I dug it out. Did, yeah. you, did you find yeah, it? Yeah, I haven't. I haven't played. I haven't played that disc yet. But I did. I was unearthing <laughs> stuff. Uh, I think back in the fall, I was digging out and cleaning the garage, and I, I found my record player. So was this in preparation for another garage sale? No, <laughs> you probably. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it was after the garage sale, and we decided we needed to get some of that other stuff cleaned out. Um, there a little bit more you want to divulge about that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um... It's blue vinyl. What more do we need to know? Price is at uh, 99, 99 pounds. That's what, like 40 bucks? No. <laughs> 200 if you do the, if you do the conversion. Is it the other way now? It's the other now. It's always been that way. Uh, it dropped it's a little, a little less, bit. Yeah. It's a little less than 200 bucks now. But Okay. Of course, if Brexit, if the Brexit exit doesn't happen in their economy tanks, we might get it cheaper over here. <laughs> you may not get it in February. <laughs> no, I said Christmas for next okay, year. Good, yeah, give you twelve months to I'll, save up. I'll wait. I'll see what happens. <laughs> that's what I was waiting for. I was like, that's why I paused to jump in there and telling me that's what yeah. I wanted for Christmas. So you could drop the price on him. Well, what was the other one that came out that you didn't get? <laughs> What was the other one? That's the reason why. <laughs> <laughs> what was the other one? There was another one. Was that one of the Record Store Day ones too? Yeah. Because this it is was, not. It was funny because... No, this is not. This is, It's funny because I, I've always seen those things come out on vinyl and I thought, you know, I don't know, that's, you know, I, if that's a B&E collector's item, but, you know, I don't need that. Until you got me the Genesis one and I was like, I don't really like... It's, it's some, I mean, I never listened to it. It's some great artwork and it's really kind of a neat piece. So I was like... I can, maybe I do want these vinyls, you know. <laughs> it's, it's just kind of a cool. Ooh, it's, it ah. is, yeah, <laughs> and it's unique because it, I mean, there's not a lot of them out there. So. No, there isn't. Well, maybe maybe that's your specialized collectible. Maybe we would just take the posters and the autographs down off the walls no, in your office, no. and you just do no. Doctor Who vinyl. No, I'll put the vinyl up on the wall with the autographs <laughs> and the posters. All the way, I'm this one will need a very thick frame for seven LPs. Yeah, that's, yeah. wow. Be, well, that's why it's two hundred bucks. It's a yeah. Well, yeah there's <laughs> seven. It'll, it'll be like the well, old, there's what uh, twelve stories. So. Yeah, it'll be like and the it old includes a uh, mission box set too. Yeah. So, the, yeah, mission to the unknown has its own single di- sided disc with unique Dalek or a TARDIS, depending on the edition you get. Because there is a special Amazon exclusive edition 
Oh. With a heavyweight splatter vinyl. Now you got to have two. <laughs> it does not say what the special edition price is. You get one, I'll get the other one. There you go. For me. Well, now you need four because you got to have one to open. Oh, one yeah. To open <laughs> one to NRFB. Yeah, it's true. Okay, you get three and I'll get one. <laughs> That's it for news. Cool. Well, shall we move on to some feedback? Let's. First up, do you have a song? I don't have a song. <laughs> <laughs> Got to check, just in case. I had to check. Sprung it on us last week. Surprise. First up is Dan. This week it's surprise, no song. <laughs> This song is just six words on this song. No. <laughs> Dan writes, response to episode 414. This would be the last episode, right? Yes. That feels like it was so long ago. Like a full week or something. Hey guys, cool episode. I felt inclined to respond to some of the points made in the episode regarding a different side of the doctor. Quote, I feel like Jody hasn't gotten her big moment yet. End quote. At 56 minutes and 50 seconds in. And, quote, she hasn't been in the spotlight quite as much, 5714. The moment that stands out to me that very much could have been a big moment for her is in the Battle of Ranskor of Kalus, which I know I mispronounced, when she discovers Tim Shaw's plot to commit planetary genocide several times over. By this point, I had felt underwhelmed in the way she was written regarding her previous reactions, such as to Robertson killing the giant spider, Charlie's mail bombing attempt, and Becca putting people on trial over the accusation of them being witches at the risk of killing them. I've seen people say that those were great moments for her, but I had honestly felt that she was pretty wet, aka showing a lack of forcefulness or strength of character. That said, I chalked all that up to her attempting to figure out her own character, and waited to see how Chibnall would add layers to the character near or in the battle. So, to see her give the reaction she did upon learning of Shaw's genocidal plot, basically confirmed in my mind where I should pinpoint as a glaring flaw in Series 11, and that Jody's range as an actor isn't being fully drawn from enough, because I've seen her act in a more icy, serious manner in previous productions like Antigone alongside Chris Reckleson. She even says at one point, just after she finds out about Shaw's plot, that, quote, he's one of those people that really irritates me. Instead of having the writing and directing slow, show more of the irritation with her voice, face, and movement in a way that totally reflects the seriousness of the situation. Guys, I know we don't have to agree on everything, but when it comes to genocide, I'm sure we can all agree that genocide, <laughs> especially done several times, like how Shaw was intending to do, is a very serious matter. I really do feel there was a missed opportunity here, and perhaps if she was in the spotlight more, then we might have seen more opportunities meet their full potential. Because of the reaction she did end up giving, whether due to the writing or direction, as well as other flaws I felt were in the episode, I felt like my suspension of disbelief was broken. This might make me sound <laughs> like a bad person. <laughs> Cody agrees with you. <laughs> but because of that, to me, I didn't feel convinced millions of families were going to die by Tim Shaw's malicious intent. I instead felt convinced that the genocidal plot was just put there in place in a quick way by the writer to amplify the tension, but it failed for me because I felt that I wasn't as executed well enough as it could have been. My viewpoint is that even a nice doctor, which I've been told Judy is meant to, or Jody has meant to be, would have shown a bigger, more serious reaction toward Tim Shaw's genocidal intent if she had been well written enough. Now I'm not asking for her to be like Times I'm not asking for her to be like Times Champion or the Oncoming Storm or Capaldi when he's making his epic speeches over humans not getting along with Zygons. I'm more so asking for her to, reactions, attitudes, personality to be presented in a way that totally reflects the seriousness going on around her in the serious situations she's being placed in. I also feel that it's possible to show the Doctor getting angry in such a way that she's still kind, a.k.a. righteous anger. Really, though, I felt the only moment that fully drew in potential from Whitaker's acting was the moment she tells off the Thagerians in Demons of the Punjab. It's you who are desecrating this planet. I know who you are. I know what you do. And it's not happening here. Leave these people alone. They're under my protection now. That, to me, felt much more convincingly powerful of how serious she was than with what she was given to work with in the battle. And that was just over a few aliens she thought were assassins. I feel it's stuff like this that can help add more contrasting sides to the Doctor's personality, because I feel what helps make the Doctor more interesting is how many different sides are consistently shown. 
as opposed to a doctor that's mostly quirky, which I feel is too quirky at the risk of getting repetitive. I'm getting a very similar vibe from Whitaker's doctor, like how I did with McCoy's doctor, in that season 24, he was played up too quirky in a way that was felt pretty uninteresting. And it wasn't until season 25 that McCoy's doctor got more interesting for me, so I do hope that Whitaker's doctor gets more interesting in series 12. It just makes me think back to what a Stephen Moffat said regarding the Doctor's character during the 50th anniversary. You can be as funny as you like with the Doctor, and you can be as silly, and you can fall over, and you can play the spoons, but you really must in those moments, because where it's required to be able to turn to ice, because underneath all the different versions of that man is a scary creature. Thanks for reading, guys. If anything else, I'd like to conclude my response with this. If the 13th Doctor won't show a big, angry reaction over Tim Shaw attempting to commit several planetary genocides... Then what will she show anger over? Interesting question. There's some good points he's brought yeah. up there. I'll, I'll give him that. Well thought through. Yeah. I don't disagree with you, Dan. I think you, you kind of uh, very eloquently kind of put into maybe even better words some of what I've been struggling with. So I don't have anything to add to it. <laughs> Unfortunately, only time will tell. We'll have to see what happens with series 12. Very true. Well, moving on, Jameson sent us some more feedback. He writes, Rants, tangents, and who? Chan, comment, question, no. (laughs) So, Chikar Vortexers. If you understood the first part of that salutation, then you are truly nerds of the highest order. (laughs) If you don't know, that opening phrase is Mando for hello. Literally translated, it means, so you're alive. In this email, I'll cover episodes 44 through 48. In episode 44, you comment on whether the Dathomir witches from Star Wars, the Clone Wars, were inspired by the Sisterhood of Karn. While I can't attest to that, I can give a little background on the Dathomir and Nightmare Sisters in general, in case anyone is still interested. The planet Dathomir and its inhabitants originated in a 1994 novel, The Courtship of Princess Leia, by Dave Wolverton. In this novel, the prince of the Hapes clusters is offered to Leia for marriage. Anne gets jealous, wins the day deed to the planet Dathomir in a Sabak game, and kidnaps Leia and takes her there to get an answer. Good novel. Also ties up the plot thread from the X-Wing novels. So Dathomir has been around for a while, well before the Clone Wars repurposed them. Also, questions for you. Are there any TV stories that you haven't covered by this point? Second, considering you've had a good taste of all the companions that have been on TV and probably most of the audio-only companions, who are your top five companions? I'll accept both TV and Big Finish companions, as I consider Big Finish canon on par with the TV shows after Moffat had the Eighth Doctor list off his audio companions in Night of the Doctor. Top top five companions. I'm sure these have changed over the years. (laughs) You'll probably hear different lists (laughs) from us (laughs) as you you go through our uh, back catalog, but uh, Sarah Jane Smith... Obviously, number one, top number one for me. Um, I'm also a big fan now of Ace, which has probably changed and gone up the the ladder a bit since we started this uh, (laughs) project. Um, Top five. Wow, this is where it gets really tough. Uh, The Brig, if you count him as a companion, I think would be in my top five. And I do count him as a companion. Um, I think somewhere in there... I hate ranking these because what, somebody that might be in my top five now probably won't be <laughs> next week, or I'll think of somebody else and go, wait, no, that one's in my top five. Um, gosh, you know, I really like Charlie from uh, the Big Finish Audios. I uh, really like the Evelyn from the Big Finish Audios. Um, that probably rounds it out. They're pretty close. Uh, there are a lot more that I like. Adric. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Ina Barbara are way up there in the list, obviously. Yeah. Steven. I've really grown to love Steven Jamie. So there's a bunch. Gosh, I don't even, I can't even I can't even make a top five. Yeah, it's hard to do top five. I could do easily do top ten. Uh Jamie Zoe. Amy Rory. Charlie. Is that one and two or is that is that one, two, I, three, four? I think that's one, two, three, four. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it kind of comes as a package deal though. I mean. But Jamie can kind of, you know, Amy Rory, I think. Amy Rory's Amy got Rory a, package a package deal. deal. Although so Rory that buys was, me an extra one. That's one and a half. The pawn and a half. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like Evelyn a lot. I like Ian and Barbara. I'm trying to think of anyone. Uh, Sarah Jane. What about Lilo? 
<laughs> Chameleon. Oh, Nissa. Nissa K-9. Would be, Nissa would be another one that's... I, I've there. always liked Nissa. Uh, not based on the television episodes, although she was great, but once we got into some of the Big Finish stuff, I really kind of fell in love with her more, so... Definitely K-9. <laughs> that's probably the top of the list, actually. Oh, Romana. I forgot about Romana. Yeah, no, I can't. I'm sorry, I can't rank them. <laughs> I know top, top, top one is Sarah Jane and Briggs up there, too. But. I don't know that we're asking necessarily for a complete ranking. Just Donna, five love of Donna. your favorites. <laughs> love Donna. I didn't like I, Donna. I, you'll, I like... you'll find this out later, but I didn't like Donna Noble. Maybe you've already got there yet. Didn't like Noble, Donna Noble, the runaway bride. Hated her. When I saw she was coming back, I was like, no. And then I ended up loving her. So I like Martha after the halfway through the season. <laughs> <laughs> when she gets over pining for the doctor, I really like Martha. Sean? Oh, number one with the bullet is obviously Sarah Jane Smith because, you know, she's it. Um, definitely Ian and Barbara. Another package deal. Another package deal. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's there's just no splitting those up. Um, also Donna Noble. I really like Evelyn from the, from the Big Finish Audio. Um, I, yeah, I might even put Aramim up there. I, I, I find that the, the Aramim audios that we've listened to really kind of enhance my enjoyment of the fifth doctor era. She's a little, I, I think she enhances my enjoyment, but she's a little uneven. She's a little uneven character. because of the story writing, yeah, yeah. Uh, which I, you know, is, I think is unfortunate, but I, I enjoy her as a character. The stories maybe not so much, but. Oh, um, Benny. Now that I'm reading the, uh, Virgin New Adventures, I love Benny. And Ace would definitely be up there. But I've always had a soft spot for Leela. Um, Lucy? I do like Lucy. <laughs> you yeah, do like Lucy. Right? I really like Lucy. She took a while to war- for me to warm up to her, but I like her now. I know. There's too many. <laughs> it's too hard to choose. Bill. Uh, I really liked Bill. Bill. Yeah, Bill yeah. was great, too. Another question. What would you recommend more, watching Who in Order or jumping around? I would say watch New Who in Order, starting with Eccleston. However, Eccleston, Smith, and Whitaker all make good springboards into the series. Classic Who, I'm not so not sure on. I guess I would jump around to get a feel for it. Then if you're really ambitious, watch it all the way through. Jameson, on the uh, upcoming episode of Tardis Sauce over on Sci-Fi for Me, <laughs> we actually talk a little bit about that. So yeah. you want to tune in there, they probably get our answer, your answers yeah. on that. Another question. Have you any of you listened to the War Doctor audio dramas from Big Finish? I enjoyed them. John Hurt was excellent and still the Doctor we've grown to know and love. The relationship between the Doctor and Elystra is wonderful, and it's a shame that the actress passed away, and we won't get any more of her as she played well with McGann's Doctor as well. On a side note, John Hurt starred in an audio adaptation of H.G. Wells' Invisible Man from Big Finish as the title character before his passing. Despite never read, having read the no- original novel, I thoroughly enjoyed the audio. i definitely say it's worth your while. Keith, yes. you've listened to that. Yes, that is absolutely fantastic, Jump, as is the War Doctor. Jumping back real quick, Jamie, uh, we have not reviewed... War Doctor always yet, but Keith and I have listened to it. We both enjoyed yeah. it. So. On the topic of Rutans, sworn enemy of the Santarans, we get to see a segment of their war in Prisoners of Time, issue 5. They also appear in their own Castle of Fear, main range 127, featuring the Fifth Doctor and Nyssa. It was fun and had a Python-esque feel to it. I was looking through your episodes and discovered that a new feature, that a few feature the virus arc. I also noticed you haven't covered the Sixth Doctor and Charlotte Pollard arc yet. <laughs> yeah, when's that going to happen, Sean? We're working on it. I'm going to skip this next bit because it is a bit of story. Boy, <laughs> <laughs> Listen to episode 45 when you guys gave Mark his geek card back. <laughs> yeah. That was a callback. The Antilles you can think of the name of is Wedge Antilles, who flew in the battles of Yavin, Hoth, and Endor. How would we have forgotten that? Then later, in the novels, became the leader of a rogue squadron. I don't think that was us forgetting that. I would have forgot Wedge Antilles. I know at one time we had a discussion of there were two Antilles characters, Captain Antilles and Wedge Antilles. They're two different characters. But uh, This is episode 45, huh? Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I have no clear memory of that, Senator. I'd have to agree with Holly from Wisconsin uh, in the fact that Series 4 being my favorite tenant season. This does include the specials as part of Series 4. <laughs> Cheating <laughs> My favorite Tenth Doctor companion is Martha Though Donna comes in a very close second Never really got why everyone gloms onto Rose As being so amazing She was fine but definitely not a top favorite 
I think that Series 4 is where Ten truly came into his own as a doctor. When I think of Ten, I think of Series 4. Listening to your Santaran adversary archive, Santar ha! Santar ha! Santar ha! <laughs> While I never really had any aff- affection for the Santaran experiment, it's good, but it just kind of sits in the middle between Ark and Genesis. The Invasion of Time is one of my favorites. Every moment between the Doctor and Barusa just shines and is a joy to watch. It's nice to see Tom stretch his acting legs a bit and the whole chase around the TARDIS interior is fun. On a side note, Tom Baker guest starred in an episode of the TV show Remington Steel called Hounded Steel as the main villain. Yeah, we'll talk about that a little later in, in your run of back, <laughs> backstories too. It was kind of weird seeing him in a role other than the Doctor, but he'd make for a good adversary. Also in The Invasion of Time, you talk briefly about the Castellan. He does have a name, Castellan Kellner, and he is a gem. He's slimy, weasley, he's perfect. Played by Milton Johns, he's an iconic doc- iconic character who you don't easily forget. This was the actor's third appearance in Doctor Who, having previously played Bennick and the Enemy of the World, a great story with Patrick Troughton in a dual role, and Guy Crawford in the Android Invasion. Crawford is the eye patch guy. The Vardans from the Invasion of Time do return to Doctor Who. They appear in at least one First Doctor companion chronicle that's part of a trilogy, which I haven't gotten around to listening to yet. They also appear in the series opener for the fifth series of the Fourth Doctor Adventures from Big Finish, which I have listened to and found rather enjoyable. It features K-9 and Romana too. And finally, they appear in the Virgin New Adventure No Future, featuring the Seventh Doctor. Benny and Ace, which is the fifth of a five-book linked story arc within the series. Good arc of novels, by the way. There's some interesting plot points towards the end that I won't give away here. Did you know that before there was Big Finish, BBC did a handful of radio episodes that were full cast audio dramas. There was Slip Back in 86 with Six and Perry. Then in 93 and 96, The Paradise of Death and The Ghosts of In Space, both by Barry Letts, featuring the third Doctor, Sarah Jane, and the Brigadier. I don't remember Slip Back being all that great, but I enjoyed the two third Doctor stories, and I think that you guys might like them too. An interesting idea that I love to see happen, if not on TV, then definitely from Big Finish, is a meeting between Captain Jack and River Song. Big Finish has access to both actors, so I could easily see River showing up in a Torchwood story. She seems to be showing up everywhere else. (laughs) (laughs) Or Jack appearing in part of a Diary of River Song box set. I'd expect the latter to be more likely. Also, John Barrowman and Alex Kingston both appeared on Arrow, though I don't know, I don't think they had any scenes together. Barrowman played a Malcolm Merlin, while Kingston played a less important part of the role of Dinah Lance, Laurel and Sarah Lance's mother. I agree with you guys on subtitles. I watch most of my most DVDs with subtitles, especially British shows. I agree that oftentimes the incidental music and sound effects overpower the voices, making it hard to hear what's being said. And my hearing is, for the most part, fine. What I don't like, is especially on Doctor Who, is on older DVDs. The subtitles don't always match what's being said, either leaving bits out or simplifying the dialogue a bit. When I watched Spearhead from Space as part of my watch through of Who, I ended up watching the version included on the Doctor Revisited special for the third Doctor, rather than the normal DVD version, because the Doctor Revisited had accurate subtitles. There are very few things that leave subtitles off the Arrowverse being among them. I don't know if you're aware but or have covered, but there's a Doctor Who Star Trek crossover comic series titled Assimilation Squared. It features the 11th Doctor, Amy, and Rory meeting the next-gen crew facing a Cybermen Borg alliance. It also features a flashback with a 4th Doctor meeting the original series crew and Cybermen. Good story, but not a fan of the art style as the main story, not the main storyline. I think that was one of your critiques about it, too. Yep. Yep. I'm listening to episode 48 now. It's the one with a Christmas movie read-off in the cold open and a discussion of your work's Thanksgiving meal, or lack thereof. (laughs) I'm not a huge watcher of Christmas movies. Sorry, guys. However, the Christmas movie that my family watches every year is National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. And in listening to you talking about expecting a Thanksgiving meal every year because the company had started a tradition that's not, and then not getting it, reminded me very much of the lack of Christmas bonus in Christmas Vacation movie, which Sean pointed out when I unpaused my device after listening to this. <laughs> Also, two other slight details. One, did you know that the actor who played Rusty in Christmas Vacation is the same actor who now plays Leonard in The Big Bang Theory? Yep. I just found that out just recently. Really? Really? Yeah, I didn't know it was him. Johnny Galecki? And two, how could you not have Die Hard or Lethal Weapon in your Christmas movie list? Especially Die Hard. Well, that's been since changed. (laughs) That's been a For Sean, for sure. Also, white meat or dark meat on the turkey? 
I'm a dark meat man myself. One little thing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> One little thing in the Unicorn and the Wasp. With casting, Fenella Woogler, Agatha Christie, has also been a, fru- f- a few audio gr- audios from Big Finish. Morella Windigo in Nevermore. Leanne in Ghostwalk and Helen Frenor in Fitz's story. The unicorn is Felicity Jones, who played Jen Urso in War Oak 1. And finally, Colonel Hugh, the guy in the wheelchair, is played by Christopher Benjamin, who is much more famous among Whovians as Henry Gordon Jago and Sir Keith Gold in Inferno, surprisingly. I think that's everything for now, at least for as far as feedback of on old episodes and random comments go. However, there's one more bit I wanted to add in. So, the New Year's special. It was good. Was it the best holiday special or my favorite? Probably not. The scenes between Ryan and Graham and Aaron were good. I really liked the design of the Dalek mutants and the new Dalek casing redesign, even though it's probably a one-off. I thought the Doctor scenes when she confronts the Dalek and rebuilds its casing, and then again in the communications hub, were well done. Overall enjoyable, not outstanding, but enjoyable. So they've got a whole year to make it the next season. I love Graham, who seems to have gotten the most development, and Ryan's grown as a character, somewhat mostly being tied to Graham's development. I hope the next season they develop Yaz more. I want to hear her, I want to like her, but it seems like she's just sort of there, despite having two episodes focused on, focusing on her and her family. I really do think that they could have just gone with Graham and Ryan as companions for this season, and then maybe added Yaz for the next. That way, Graham and Ryan's evolution would be more complete, and they could focus more on Yaz. Maybe they will next season. As you might have guessed, as well as being a huge Doctor Who fan, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. While I prefer Legends to Story Group Canon, or Disney Canon as it's called, and the novels and comics and games to the films, I still enjoy all of it. I have to say that the Legacy of the Forest series is my favorite novel series, and Star Wars Legacy, the first run of 50 issues, plus Legacy War by John Ostrander and Jan Duserma, is my favorite comic series. My favorite film, because I know you're going to ask, is Rogue One. <laughs> I'm currently working on creating a simple brief guide to the big finished Doctor Who audios. Whether I send it, as, <coughs> send it out as print or audio, I haven't decided yet. Right now, I'm starting, I've am starting. i started with the main monthly range. It may be a while before it's ready, as I'm not sure how many releases are going to be included with each guide, or how long it will take for me to get done. Something to look forward to. Again, I apologize for the length. I find a lot of things to comment on. As always, great show. Keep up the great work. Jamie. I'm not going to try to pronounce that, which he says, Mando is for goodbye. Literally, maybe we'll meet again. Very good. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Jamie. And some of those things you ask, you'll come across here as we as you <laughs> proceed through our back catalog. As you keep going. That's right. He sent in a little bit more, this time on Operation Volcano. Yeah, this time he says, uh, subject, Operation Volcano Review, message, Chan, comment, question, though. So this will be brief, Doctor Who, the seventh Doctor, Operation Volcano. I got this through my local library as a trade paperback. I thought the main story was good, an enjoyable story with good art. The second story in the trade was okay, didn't care for the art. The bonus story with Ian, Barbara, and Susan was really good with good art. Operation Volcano, the story was good. It kept you guessing a bit at who to trust, who were the good guys and the bad guys. Great art. Nice use of time travel. Nice to see the Countermeasures team back from Remembrance of the Daleks. They've got their own series from Big Finish now. Overall, good story, good collection. Hope Titan does more with the classic Doctors. Would love to see more 8 and Josie Day. Anyways, that's it for now. Jamie, Chan, in transmission, though. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. And, and last up is ti- Holly. Timely <clears throat> enough here, she also uh, sent in some feedback about the uh, uh, review that we'll be doing this week, or the comic we'll be reviewing this week. Holly says, hey, guys, this is my first dive into the Seventh Doctor comic book series, and I have to say that I enjoyed the story. The alien was interesting, and how the cave drawings placed into the whole thing was a nice touch. It kept you guessing throughout the storyline. Ace had some great scenes. I got the Volume 1 Omnibus Collection. It had a few other stories in there that were enjoyable too. I may have the second volume. I may give the second volume a try when it comes out. I'll wrap it up here. Holly from Wisconsin. Well, that's if they continue doing the <laughs> seventh doctor. Do yeah, I hope they do too. Because um, I think that was just, that was a miniseries, right? So yeah. they, they haven't announced any uh, as far as we know. things going from forth. Nothing, nothing hopefully, official. Hopefully they do. Well, let's move on to our review. Sounds good. Doctor Who, Operation Volcano. An unknown alien intelligence in orbit around the Earth. Astronauts under attack. A terrifying, mysterious landing in the Australian interior. 
the future of the world itself at stake. Countermeasures activated, and the Seventh Doctor and Ace are slap bang in the middle of it all. This is Operation Volcano. Bum bum bum. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, got, I, got, I got stuck reading, so I was. Oh, that's all right. I fell back into it. <laughs> <laughs> you were re- re- refreshing yourselves as we put ourselves off for a couple weeks. I really enjoyed this, guys. I thought it was uh, well written. I would think I can ap- echo both uh, points that that Jamie made and and uh, Holly made. That the story is really good. Yeah. Uh, I enjoyed having the countermeasures team back. Uh, it makes me look forward to listening to the big finish audios when we get around to those. Um, I thought the the it, it it falls into the fold, and I think it's appropriately so since uh, Andrew Cartmel and uh, Ben Aronovich both you know worked on this, or at least Ben lent his characters to it. I think Andrew wrote most of it, but um, I think the the Cartmel story you can really feel Cartmel's intention with the Doctor mm-hmm. in this story. Uh, we talk the, a little bit about spot yeah, on, we talk a little always. bit about the fan name Master Plan. And I think that, uh, yeah, I, Cartwell knows this doctor. He knows this companion. He knows these characters really well. And uh, he still adds kind of a little bit of that gravitas and mystery to the doctor in this, even even for as, as short of a story as this ends up being because right. it is, is, you know, just a miniseries. Um, I also like the uh, use of time travel. I like the fact that, um, help me with the uh, captain's name, not the captain's name, the... Uh, Gilmore? Gilmore, thank you. Group captain. Group captain. Group captain. Uh, Gilmore, you know, ended up going into the future. And then the doctor ended up bringing him back and <laughs> replacing him back. Because that was, a, that was something I thought when they set out to do this. I thought, well, they've done some countermeasures. And I think they've done some countermeasures with group captain Gilmore, in the, you know, beyond this era. Right. And as they've an, got to get him back gentleman. there somewhere. Yeah. How are they going to manage How that? How are they going to fix it? And so by doing it the way they did, I thought that was very clever. Um, I too like well, the it fact makes you question him the entire time. Yeah, well, I which do I too. Think is great. I do too like the fact that you don't know really who are the bad guys in this. You know, they they keep you guessing through the whole story, and I think uh, maybe some of uh, Cartmel's recent writing of mystery novels <laughs> <laughs> play, plays into that a little bit. But uh, I think he does a good job crafting a story where you don't know where they're where it's going to turn next. Uh, I think he really makes the hero, the doctor, the hero of this story as well at every turn when you don't expect it. So mm-hmm. I thought that was really neat. I don't know if it's the Australian setting and countermeasures, but it kind of felt like a Lethbridge Stewart story to me. Now I really want Andrew Cartman to write a Lethbridge Stewart novel <laughs> because I enjoyed this so it, much. It did have that kind of same I, feel. To I agree with the second part of that. I don't think it was the fact that it was set in Australia because there's only one story. I, I know. There's only one Lethbridge Stewart story. I kept oh, thinking, excuse me, two Lethbridge Stewart stories set in I kept Australia. thinking of that story while I was reading this, though. <laughs> there were shades of that one, I guess. Um, I like to of, place it in the timeline. Okay, are they there yet? <laughs> a, lot, a lot of wonderful little nods, as you pointed out, with the time travel and then the very neat trick with the uh, Adventures of Marco Polo and today's newspaper yeah putting it behind the cubby yep. on the wall and the yep. doctor just shows up yeah what a fantastic idea we don't need a subspace temporal transmitter <laughs> we just need a dead drop no it's 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 a terrific uh device for a story especially when you're talking about time travel you know as soon as he puts it in there the doctor shows up because that's how time travel works yeah and just, a great way to expedite things for a comic yeah yes absolutely really great stuff there um i liked um Ace, Ace is I terrific in this. Yes, the, the 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 bait and switch with the way it was set up that we thought something really terrible was happening with whatever she was volunteering for, and then it turned out that it wasn't this terrible thing. That it was the communication. She thing. had to communicate with it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the, the the whole communication segment with her and the and the aliens was great. Um, I liked the. <laughs> ridiculous number of double crosses and secret agents <laughs> and who's working for who that are present in all of this. I um, I thought the radiation suits, I was kind of hoping for a callback to something else. I, I they, they went to go get them and then they showed up and they were just wearing, you know... Plastic. plastic. Ponchos. <laughs> Saran wrap baggies. Ponchos. And I, I went, aww. <laughs> kind of a missed opportunity there, wasn't it? You could have given us something from a previous episode maybe, but... No. <laughs> I thought it was cool though. I mean... It's a good just, idea. Just ran around. <laughs> At least what bubble wrap. <laughs> yeah, it's a very, very, very futuristic. 
um, but yeah, just a, just a lot of it was. You're right. It felt very much tonally like some of the Lethbridge Stewart stories, and well, I, I, I that probably remember. chalks up more to just the fact that it's. Well, it's unit it, it's, it's unit Yeah, yeah. and I yeah. think that that probably lends to well, it too, because I would too... agree with you that it does kind of feel like a that that era of story or that that yeah. type of storytelling. Even them too. I can't remember the two female characters' names, but that could easily have been uh, Anne and oh, I just blanked on. Sally? Yeah, Sally. That could have easily been the two of them yeah. off doing stuff. and Thoroughly enjoyable story, though. Yeah, I liked that. And I, I thought the artwork was phenomenal throughout all of it. The artwork was really good throughout this run. I'd love him to come back and uh, get Andrew to write some more stories because yeah. I think he's really got a, a, a knack for writing, especially short form comic stories. I, I, some of the novels that I've read, uh, well, I guess I've only read one of his now uh, in the virgin new adventures but he paints a really good story when he's writing and it's real visual in your mind what he's writing so to put that kind of writing with visuals i think even enhances it even more yeah absolutely the other bit of this that i think really uh, kind of enhances the, uh, the the lethbridge stewart feel is the ending where we get to a full-blown bond yeah <laughs> uh, you know we, we, we've got a spaceship that's going to go up and rain nuclear warheads down on the planet right and so we're dropping a, a, a full-blown paratrooper squad into the middle of this and it's very doctor no th- th- there's there's machine guns and and swamp gas and things and uh, you know then ian gets transported up and <laughs> stuck in outer space forever so yeah and, and- it also could have easily just been a third Doctor story. Yeah. With some tweaks to it. Yeah, that's true. In fact, it's got a lot Aside of from the, Ace. It's got a bit of the formula <laughs> of that as well, yeah. Really, really well done. And Glenn, you did uh, or did not uh, continue on with the, the yeah, shorts. I got, I got Hills of Beans. You got Hill of Beans? Yeah, yep. So Hill of Beans is one of the stories that was in the uh, graphic novel. It was not included, I don't believe, in the individual. Um, it was. <laughs> In the serialized? It was. Oh, okay. The um, only one that's not in the individual, because I read the individual comics. You guys read the uh, trade paperback uh, or the graphic novel version. Um, the only one that wasn't was that uh, Ian Barber, the first Doctor one, that we've already oh, reviewed okay. as a... Uh, that's where I get confused. Uh, a, uh, no, we haven't reviewed that one. Oh, we haven't. There's a there's two oh, I thought more it was stories. A, oh, okay. I thought it was the free comic book day one. Ace is the oh, free that's comic. right. Okay. Yeah, there's a third. Okay, so the, the third do- the third Seventh Doctor story I did do because gotcha. that wasn't we were doing issues one through three of <laughs> the comic series so that's what i read so well this one's uh, by richard denick uh and it is a kind of sort of sequel to um greatest show in the galaxy well i think you could you could answer as a you could say it's a, a continuation especially with the character of mags um uh returning and the guy ga- and the Actually, greatest show returns too. Yeah. I mean, it's... well, I think it's a different. Yeah, she it, it is. Over. She's taken over the circus. Yeah. She, yeah, so it's been reformed, and it's not the obviously the gods of uh, Ragnarok, Ragnarok yeah. <laughs> controlling it anymore. Uh, but yeah, no, you're right. Um, I think what I was most impressed by this is I I didn't when I first started reading it I was I thought this this artist is struggling. This isn't. This seems weird that they would commission somebody that that the artwork isn't as high quality as you expect and i know i don't I, I usually don't critique art and i'm not because i've got a point for this i think it was really I, I, I was looking at the art of this and i thought this is interesting that they would get somebody to do something that was i don't want to call it amateurist because i thought it was good art for somebody that maybe wasn't a full-time artist but then to find out that this was actually jessica martin that did the art for this who plays mags who played Mags oh, in the is series. Who, okay. This is her. She she did the artwork for this story that Richard Denick wrote. So not only is she, her character in this story, she did the artwork. Huh. See, I thought it very much looked like 11th Doctor art. Uh, Yeah, it's close to that. I, I, mean, just, I just assumed it was the same artist. Thing. No, this is this huh. is actually Jennifer Martin doing the artwork. Uh, I did not know the that artwork was her that did it. Yes, yeah. So they... To have, I, which I think is very clever. You could call it stunt arting, <laughs> but but I think it was clever, especially since it's about her character and she's she does art. She she is an artist. She I don't think she's ever professionally done comic art before. But to ask her to come on board and do this, 
I thought was really, really clever. So Well, and I wouldn't, uh, my thought on it was I didn't think it was necessarily amateurish. It's it's very stylized it, yeah. in a certain well, way that doesn't feel it's what a, we're used to as far as yeah, comic it's book that, stuff. And I think that's what I mean is it's not something that you normally see as comic book art. Um, but it does. But you're work. right. It's closer to what you were yeah, the tenth Doctor art that you were referring. I'm sorry, eleventh Doctor art you were you were uh, referring to. It, it it does work for the story that they tell. It also kind of I think has a a comic strip feel to it. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely kind of a. Um... I thought the story was was kind of interesting. I wasn't as wowed by it, um, mainly because I wasn't. You know, I wasn't a huge fan of guard. Uh, uh, Greatest show in the galaxy, anyway. So <laughs> I think what I glommed onto it is I don't think it's the best story out there. Um, I've always thought Richard Denning's a pretty good writer, but I think that I think he could have done better than this one. But he kept tugging at my heartstrings by making all of the uh, allusions and, and references to uh, Casablanca. So I kept looking at the parallels <laughs> in this and going. In fact, I didn't even think about it. The the title called Hill of Beans. And I, I didn't even, it didn't even cross my mind about the Cla- uh, Casablanca ran- reference until I started seeing Casablanca esque references in the the book, and then I was like, "Oh, Hill of Beans, duh." Yeah. <laughs> so. And it's it's very much one of those that once you realize the Casablanca, it's about the third or fourth one that once you realize they're there, then it kind of becomes impossible not to see what they're doing with it. Uh, up to and including the ending, yeah, yep, where yep. they're all standing on the tarmac and 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 you know reenacting the end of it. And it's like okay, right. I, I I see what you did there, and I, I'm trying to decide because on the one hand I think oh that's very clever that's that's cute, and on the other hand I think that's kind of uh, it ch- it cheapens it in a way <laughs> that we just didn't get a a mag story that we kind of had to go with this. Well, we're in big yeah. taking care of that too. But yeah. you could also look at it as an homage to Casablanca. So yeah, and. and there's obviously, and it's not like we've never done an homage to Casablanca in <laughs> uh, in any format right, ever right. before. So, well, I think the subject matter kind of lends itself to being an homage too. Yeah, it's a story that I would read again, probably not right away, but it is definitely a story I would revisit down the line again. So, very good. So, um, and you said we have reviewed Armageddon. We re- we reviewed if you guys Armageddon. want to talk about the Stephen. The uh, first Doctor story, go go right ahead. Uh, again, I wasn't on board on the fact that we were doing them. <laughs> <laughs> we just said Operation Volcano. So I, I didn't know this was in it. here until I got to it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I just picked up the graphic novel. Uh, the In-Between Times, it's what it's called. And I, it's it's great. I really enjoyed this one. It's The art very much feels, again like a more detailed version of the comic strip art. And it's just a nice little story of them wandering through the TARDIS and getting to see uh, different things and some of Susan's art. I mean, there's not a lot of meat to it, but it's it's a nice uh, nostalgia uh, tug. And since they haven't really done any First Doctor stories yet, as far as Titan goes, I think it's a good, uh, a nice uh, dip of the toe, I think. John, what do you think? I agree. Um, it, it's, I mean, it's what four or five pages, so it's yeah, not it's even a quick. It's not even a side trip <laughs> um, length. Um, it, it's very, very early on in the in the run. I think this is probably even after the. Uh, I don't he's remember which pa- story. He's in his pajamas. Well, I just took that to be that he... it was night, but um, I'm trying to remember if there's a story where he's in his pajamas. I, I think it's meant to be probably after the Daleks, but it, it's it's very early on in their story. They're supposed to be getting some rest, yeah. And uh, they're just kind of wandering around the TARDIS, and they bump into Susan, who's oh, you shouldn't be wandering around. And then they talk, and uh, there's a, there's a wonderful little gag at the beginning where uh, they they walk across the chalkboard, and it's written out Barbara, Ian, but it's Barber, and then there's an A, and then Ian, and you realize that. The were names together spell out barbarian, which was quite clever. I never really caught on to that. And they kind of pick up on the, oh, you must think that we are, you know, so backwards. And, you know, they haven't fully formed that trusting relationship yet, even as, you know, student teacher um, back in these days, which I think was kind of a cool angle to take on it. Yeah. But then to delve into Susan's artwork, where she's apparently 
quite talented in one of the many angles that we didn't get. Plus, it's just a joy to see more rooms in the TARDIS. You know, <laughs> yeah, I'm absolutely. always down for yeah. a TARDIS tour. So, But it's just a cool little story. And I agree with you. The art's kind of uh, fun, and it's done in that, uh, you know, I'm not even sure what to call it, black and white, but it's dot penciled kind of yeah, kind of thing. But it was a fun one. A nice little capstone on the uh, on the graphic novel. Yeah, apparently it was originally released as a humble bump, humble, humble bundle event, and then they lumped it in with this graphic novel since you had to get it there first, and then you can pick it up here. Gotcha. Which makes me a little sad. It makes me wonder if they did that just because they wanted to get it out, or if they did that because they don't have any plans to go back and visit the first Doctor's era. I don't know. All. I hope they go back because. And get Paul Cornell to write more about it. I remember hearing an interview with him about this before it came out. I didn't realize that's what it, this is what he was talking about until just now. It's quite enjoyable. Yeah. Cool. Well, should we move on to the audios? The Death Collectors. There is only death. A very, very, very blunt disease that killed millions, a missing scientist, an ancient race of salvagers who collect and preserve the dead. The quarantine planet Anticon connects them all. When the doctor arrives on the sky station above Anticon, a single accident has already set in motion a chain of events that will mean the death of every living thing. And the only way he can stop it is to die. Again. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's kind of there for me. <laughs> I kind of liked it. I thought it had some great ideas. I don't know that it stands out as one of the best stories that I've ever heard. Uh, I really enjoy The Doctor on his own, I find, from time to time. I think that uh, when he's on his own, it's uh, it's very much like he's almost... I don't want to say he's reckless because he's not reckless, but he's he when he doesn't have a companion with him... He tends to go out on a limb a lot more. And I think I kind of like that, especially with the seventh doctor. I kind of like that um, he's maybe. In this audio, I think Master was one of them. There was another one where uh, uh, the seventh doctor was on his own that we've listened to. He's in this area, this gray area, which they've kind of visited in uh, 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 Virgin New Adventures, where you, you can tell he's kind of done. Like seven regenerations might be enough. He's seen enough death and destruction. He doesn't come across and say it so much as as his actions are more, he's a bit more reckless. He's a bit more carefree. He's a bit more, you know, well, if this is the end, this is the end. He's, he's more apt to sacrifice himself. I think also knowing that he doesn't have a companion tagged along. And so I think Sylvester McCoy could really get, there's a lot less funny in these yeah, uh, and, sure. whenever he's on his own. He's a bit darker, and I think I kind of like that from time to time. I'm glad that we bounce back into times where he does have a companion, uh, when Ace and Hex you know, are around. He's still very mysterious and dark, and he doesn't answer. <laughs> he doesn't really come forth with a lot of uh, answers to what he's doing, but I think he's he's a little more jovial and, and a little more lighthearted when he's with companions. But I, I, I So I liked that about this. It's also because it's so morose. The the story has, you know, these people that that basically make trades with death and or you know, they they trade on death, which I thought was cool. They've got this plague that's going on on this planet that they're trying to study that brings you to the brink of death, or at least brought our main guy to the brink of death. Or what was the guy's name? The intern. No, well, <laughs> the the intern does, good, but the, we find out later that Morse. the professor, yeah. The, the professor <laughs> was another thing that I, I can talk to you about. Uh, professor Mars, <laughs> Mars, um, he, you know, we, it's revealed that he actually was a carrier of this plague. And so he so, somewhat exper experienced it. And that's why he's doing this experiment, because he wants to see, you know, he's, he's, he's pushing death further to find out what, you know, unlock some mysteries, see what the other side of this is. So it's it's an intriguing story and it's got a lot of elements that I quite enjoyed. I just felt that a lot of times that it does ratchet up the suspense well in parts, but there's a lot of times where some stupid mistakes are made that I think you know even it, the, the the professor is very one of those guys who's and we've we've talked about this in other stories before. We've got the guy that's so hell bent on doing their experiments or their things that they don't see 
the bigger picture sometimes, and it's almost frustrating for when you have characters like that yeah. that are, you know just they don't see they they almost they're so smart that they're dumb in some ways, and so that that's a little frustrating in the story. I also felt that they were uh, obviously Danica and the professor were married at one time. They're separated now, but they or they're divorced now, but they still work together. It's almost like they were trying to show us that they still had a little something together. You know, obviously he's still pined for her. He was very protective and sometimes very overprotective of her. But I just didn't feel like they went far enough with the developing whatever relationship was going on there or at least giving us a little more to that that I, I kind of felt like from his side, you did get it from her side. It seemed like, you know, there was no more connection there but they didn't really kind of delve into that well enough so i thought that was kind of left a little flat so i didn't i didn't have any i i felt for her because i felt that she was kind of victimized in this whole thing you know she did she was being used as much as the intern guy that that ends up getting the plague um but i just i didn't i couldn't feel much for the professor just i guess maybe that's the 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 point is that character kept bringing me down so much that i i he was what i didn't like about the story so yeah i i could have done without that i, I really wanted to like this story because i like you i'm intrigued by like the time period when the seventh doctor is traveling alone i think there's some great potential there i just don't think it explores the ideas in the story well enough not just the relationship but this virus, which isn't really a virus, I would agree with that. The too, da- yeah. the the, the Dar traders, they don't feel like they explore their uh, civilization well enough to kind of understand what's really going on through most of the story. And you kind of, it's such a so many untapped potential ideas for a story that they just scratch the surface of. They could have done a lot more with. I think that's where its biggest failings are for me. It is one hundred percent all of that. And it's overproduced in, in, in an effort to make it atmospheric and, and hit those notes that, that Glenn talked about with it being, you know, ratcheting up the tension. The it, It's one of those where normally Big Finish, I, I feel like you, you can say Big Finish prides themselves on being able to do layered audio and do it in such a way that it works wonderfully because you've got the voice track and you've got the sound effects and you've got the music and you've got this really all-encompassing um you know, sound, this this wall of sound that comes at you and immerses you in the adventure. And this one, I don't know if it's because of the particular choices they made for what the Dark Traders sound like or what the computer program sounds like, but it, it just became a literal wall of noise. Oh, yeah. That it was Several just times. constantly being bombarded with screeches and hisses and pops and crackles I, and it, it especially, wasn't pleasant especially to the decay to. Yeah. i appreciated what they were trying to do but i agree i think you said it well it was overproduced i think that they just went a little too far with some of that and so when you pair those two things together that you're not explaining quite enough i mean there's some fantastic ideas i love the idea of the dark traders and the fact that they are so intrigued with the doctor because he reeks of death because he's died seven times. That to me is a, what a great. Oh, they're already ready to collect him because yeah. they think he's dead. I think oh, that, yeah. that, 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 that to me is a, what do you mean you're not dead? You know, I, yeah, let's do that. Let's do some more of that. Um, and, you know, Danica and the professor that they have this. He, you're right. It's not really until later that we kind of find out that I think he's, he's still pining for her. Yes. Throughout the thing, I kind of got the impression that, yes, they had this relationship and that it was done now, but I got it. I thought it pretty clear on her end that because, well, he's married to the job. That he, that, that was yeah, what it didn't yeah, work. That right, he was always right. holed up in the lab and that she, you know, but she was unwilling to, she was still loyal to him, but she wasn't devoted to him in that way anymore. Right, right. Uh, and then once it became clear that you sent the intern down there in order to infect him, that was kind of the final, yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> this isn't happening. Yeah, and then they tried to backtrack it a little bit for her near the end. Yeah. When she finds out, oh, well, oh, you're dying after all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, at, at, too, at that point it felt was, like too, it was too late. Yeah. Too little too late. But there were so many little things that were like, oh, this is kind of cool. This is kind of a the idea. This is kind of a, why aren't you doing anything with this? <laughs> why do we have so much stuff going on and we go back to the atmospheric stuff? And it just, it, it, it was very frustrating. Um, like you, I, I find the seventh doctor in particular, very intriguing when he's alone. Um, and he, cause he, he does, he just, he has a, it's, 
I think kind of just in general, the Doctor Without a Companion is a little freer to act. Um, he's a little... Um, well, not, I think you feel careless, you but... feel compelled to do more of the heavy lifting as an actor, I think. Yeah. And so, yeah. even though you still got peripheral characters like Danica and Moss, but um, you feel like you have to do a little more of the heavy lifting. So I think you're able to put a little more in it, you know. And I think Sylvester McCoy does put a little more into it that maybe we don't get when he's paired up with with companions. And I liked him with Danica. I thought they were a great pairing together. To the point where we go all the way up to the... Yeah, he makes the offer. He, he kind yeah, of, sort yeah. of makes the offer, and then, I don't think this would work. Yeah. yeah. Do you recognize the voice? <laughs> so, here's what I was going to bring up. Something kept taking, taking me out of the story, and it's the fact that it occurred to me, within the first probably 15, 20 minutes of the story, that it was uh, Catherine Parkinson who played... <laughs> uh, uh, Jen- Jennifer, yeah, on uh, on the IT crowd. So then, when I put that in my head, and she keeps calling the professor Mars, but with her or Moss, Moors, 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 but th- with her British accent, she keeps saying Moss. <laughs> <laughs> and so I keep coming out of it, going, "Oh my God, <laughs> you totally sound like Jennifer, and you're referring to him as Moss." And I guess I just would take me out every time. I was like. I wish they had picked another name for this guy <laughs> because she can't say Moors. Moors. She keeps saying Moss. <laughs> it's like, this isn't working for me. So that was another ding on it. And it's nobody's fault. Oh, no. It's just the fact that there's this correlation between the two. And I kept thinking, I, I would giggle a little bit every time she made <laughs> Moss because then I would start thinking of a scene from the IT crowd. And there's nothing funny about this. No, it really isn't. It really isn't. <laughs> So anyway, yes, I, 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 it wasn't immediate. It was after about 15 minutes. I thought she was probably only in it for a few minutes before. Well, no, because she started out. No, I think it was later when they were on the ship. When she met the doctor and was talking, that's about the time yeah. that I started going, now I know why this is familiar. I think that's her. And then I finally had to go look. So. Yeah, I had to go double check to make sure I was right. And... I really would have figured out when I heard her say Moss the first time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, should we move on to the... Anything else about Death Collector? Spider's Shadow. Spider's Shadow. I think my final comments about the first part might come into play here in the third, in the second, the last part. (laughs) (laughs) It's the eve of battle and the martial princesses Luis and Allison are hosting a royal ball, but there are unwelcome visitors in the garden and a sequence of events spiraling out of control. And what's more, the doctor doesn't even remember arriving. (laughs) Okay, so I liked this part... Better than the other part. I did too. Yeah, me too. This was fun, and it's uh, you know, it's not anything that we haven't already seen before. No, but it's a neat, it's neat storytelling device, yeah. and when it's done well, it's done well, and it's done well here. It is done well. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and I think that's the problem is the, the the resolution of this so completely hinges on the previous story. It, on, re- it, it, on resolving the previous it, it, story. It, it just yes, jumped right yes. back into that whole, oh, we got that thing in the box again, don't we? <laughs> uh. This okay. certainly was better than oh, the yeah. Six Doctor story that they did that with. But you know where I'm coming from. But, like we, yes, it, it was right just... That alley. It, and I think giving the entity of the plague or whatever a voice in a way was poorly, not poorly done. Didn't need to be done. You know yeah. what I mean? To 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 kind of correlate it between the two and its, um, uh, what do I want to say? It's realization of 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 existence that just I it it went down a road that I was like, yeah, I just it, it got silly. You had a really clever thing going here, and then when you finally introduce introduce the uh, element that's been creating this, then you just kind of went south with, or not even, not, not even south. Uh, yeah, yeah, you went south with it. It just it, the story just kind of goes. Ooh, then it Downhill. became, I am the nucleus of the yeah, swarm, exactly. and I'm yeah. going to kill everything. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. So I just, yeah, I was a little bothered. By and I love that me. story. You guys know I love <laughs> enemy with Invisible Enemy. But yeah. it's like, eh. Yeah. And there were spiders in the garden. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Which didn't have much to do with it other than, I mean, they had to have a way to kind of manifest it in, in reality right. for yeah. these people. But then the spiders didn't really have much to do with it because the spiders are just the manifestation manifestation of the realism of what this entity was. So it just, yeah, it kind of lost something. So to call it, what was it? The spider? Spider shadow. Spider shadow. I thought, 
you kind of leaned heavy on that spider thing for your title. And of course you couldn't have maybe less like, I don't know, there, just something timey wimey or time related for a title. Something about a bit looper better. or something. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say time loop, but I think we've already done that. The shadows of time. In, t- in time's shadow. Or something <gasps> Ooh, like that, you know? yeah. No, I'm, I don't know. I, I kind of almost wish we'd have gotten a whole story, <laughs> all four parts about the spider invasion. <laughs> I kind of, I kind of feel like if you'd have told, if you told that story linearly, I feel like maybe that would have been pretty all right. You mm-hmm. know, like we, we, we could have had a, a base under siege and I did have gotten a into the thing. Of, and all right, cool. I did have a moment. Is this eight legs from Metabilios three? I was like, that would be really cool. We haven't seen those guys in a long time. Yeah. <laughs> See, and, I, I don't know. I don't know if the long <laughs> story would have worked as well for me because I, I the thing I like the most about it is the the time loop and the jumping and what's causing that's what I liked about it yeah so telling it linear, linearly I don't think would have worked as well no it definitely wouldn't have and I do it. appreciate the fact that the the doctor cues into it and it's about the time that we we're like okay hurry up and get, you know because you're and then he I, I'm the done with, I'm done with the time how job. to make it and he work. goes oh okay if I do this I'll time to boom nope nope Nope. Oh, this is the scene I need. You know, like, that was fun, though. Okay, I liked cool. that. Yeah. No, I think I that was neat. Yeah. Yeah. Because that happened right at the moment where you're kind of getting tired of the, the you know, you're, you're giving me a bunch you, of random information that I don't on. know what's going on. Yeah. But I know enough of the framework that you've set up. I understand that you're time jumping. I get that. But I don't know enough of the pieces involved to be able to put the puzzle together to know why you're time jumping. The doctor figures out the why and then begins to fill me in on the rest of it. At the same time that we figured out, you know, just different parts of it to come together at the end. I was like, okay, that's great. But yeah, I think I mean? one of the things I liked about these, and this kind of goes into, I've been reading the Virgin New Adventures and, and up to book, I think I started book 11 now. They're the 11th one in the line anyway. And I like, what I like is there's twice now that he's mentioned death being, him being very, being a friend of death or how do you say it? Uh, the, uh, yeah, he and death are friends. He says it twice. He says it once in each story. And it's kind of well neat. acquainted. Yeah, it's kind of neat that from the perspective of this, it's kind of a metaphoric statement that because he's seen so much death or he's been around death so much, but it's also kind of cool that it cleverly ties into death being an, a a being in the novels, which you guys had a brief taste of when we did uh, Human Nature. I think it was alluded to the yeah. being of death, and uh, th- so it's kind of neat that they they they're very coy at. No, recognizing that this is the seventh doctor to make a, a metaphor in such a way that it can tie into something else peripherally. So I kind of got a little joy out of that. Yeah, that's totally where my brain was when he said that. It was like, <laughs> I know what you got out of there. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did. Cool. Well, but that's about it. Still yeah. enjoying seventh doctor, though, guys. I'm just, he's keeps elevating up the list. So even with some clunker stories. These are still better than some of his TV stories, so. <laughs> in my opinion. It depends on the TV story. <laughs> some of the TV stories, that's what I said. What's that one by Pip and Jane with the giant brain? <laughs> I really wanted to ask Andrew Carmel about that. <laughs> he was talking about, oh, we worked with some fine writers, and I wanted to go. It's like Pip and Jane Big, and I went, no, <laughs> don't do that. Don't throw him under the bus like that. It was his first story, so. I know. <laughs> All right, so uh, what do we got coming up on the schedule, Sean? Well, if we uh, actually adhere to it, uh, next week on the schedule, we will be reviewing uh, Candy Jar Books, Lucy Wilson, Curse of the Mirror Clowns. And then the following week, we delve back into some Big Finish audio with uh, closing out Season 3, or Series 3, I'm not sure how they list them, of the Eighth Doctor Adventures. <laughs> Yay, Paul McGann. Yay, Yay Paul, Paul McGann. McGann. I think there's something else after that, but I don't remember now. So. <laughs> we're going to do... Uh, I'm sure there's something else. We're gonna Let do me rephrase. Real time. I'm sure we're going to do real time. Real time, that's yeah, what it yeah, is. Yeah. I'm sure there's something else after that. Actually, it goes out even further. If you'd like, we're going to tackle uh, Doctor Who and the Cricket Men next month, too. Yeah. So At least that's on the schedule for that's now. On. That could change. Who knows? Radio Who knows? Times could make another lengthy article that we discuss. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> The wind could blow from the east. <laughs> That's Who right. knows? Exactly right. Exactly right. 
So don't forget that you can find us on uh, Apple Podcasts, uh, Google Play uh, Music. Uh, we're also available on Stitcher, TuneIn, Tune and Player FM. Uh, you can also go just put our RSS feed in any pod, podcast aggregating device that you own and uh, you get our feed that way as well. And uh, don't forget to support us on Patreon if you can. If you already are, we appreciate it. And Keith, how can they contact us if they do want to send some more feedback? Well, if you're on our website, just click the Send Us Feedback tab and you can fill it out there. Or you can send it directly to feedback at travelingthevortex.com. You can also reach out to us on the, any form of social media. Cool. Don't forget to go check over check over on uh, Sci-Fi For Me YouTube channel for Tardis Sauce. And uh, if that's going to do it for this week, until next week, I'm Glenn. I'm Sean. And I'm Keith. Cheers. Good night, everybody. Be seeing you. Where's that elevator music coming from? <laughs> At least it's not operating room music. <laughs> that I can live with. <laughs> <laughs> you have been listening to Traveling the Vortex. Doctor Who and all of its associated programs are owned and trademarked by the BBC. No infringement is intended or implied.